Well, good evening to each of you tonight. Good to see you out. Uh, our song will be 420, 420, and this, we are going to sing another song too, so won't ask you to stand yet. You can just relax. 420. <laughs> turn way back, way back to 421. 421, and we'll invite you to stand while we sing this song. 421, we'll save by grace. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing, but all oh, the joy when I shall wake. Of the King, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Nay, the earthly house will fall, I cannot tell how soon it will be. I know my all in all is now a place in him for me, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Someday when faith golden sun beneath a rosy tented west my blessed Lord will say well done and I shall enter into rest and I shall see him face to face and tell the story said by grace and I shall see Your hopes again, my soul to him may take its flight, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. May we bow for prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Rob Miller if he'll lead us, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for this time and this place that we have to gather together here tonight. We ask for your presence to be amongst us, for um, your spirit to guide us into the truth that you would have us to learn and realize tonight. May our hearts and minds be open to uh, receive your word and allow your spirit to work within. Continue to be with the needs of your people. We pray your Mercy to be extended their way. Bless our pastor as he will teach us tonight your word. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat>
Well, we hope that will kind of set our thoughts for tonight. We're happy to see each of you here. If you want to open your Bible to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. So we're dealing with the future. And however day your, however good your day has been, if you're in Christ, the future certainly is going to hold a lot better for us. And we can rejoice in that tonight. We do have some things that we want to mention for prayer. Um, we want to continue to pray for those recovering. We're glad to see the Queens are back tonight, having been out due to the COVID deal. Others are still out because of it, either just waiting their time to uh, what they are supposed to stay away, but uh, as far as we know, everything's going in the right direction. Of course, keeping those of our church who are having uh, continual problems of life, um, Sandy Adams and Charles Maston and Linda Easter, and then we have received word tonight that they're just keeping Jane Waite comfortable at this point. Uh, n nothing expected to improve, but hey, they have just removed her from her regular regimen of medications and are just keeping her comfortable. So keep her and the family. We, uh, of course, are praying for all of them and hope that we might find our uh, consolation in the Lord Jesus Christ in such a time as this. We also need to pray for those of our country that are standing for right principles. There are some who are still on that, uh, that um, path, and so they need our prayer. We want to pray for other church ministries that are going on, as well as our own, and uh, the outreaches of the word as it goes forth. And then I think individually, we all need to pray to know how things are with us in God's sight and what uh, God would have them to be. We can always find some improvement, I'm sure, and you'll find that even men of God and the old have prayed that God would search their heart and God would make things manifest to them. And that's always a blessing to uh, want to have that soul searching. Even in the nation of Israel, God established a day in which that the people were to afflict themselves. And it was to be regarded as a true self-examination to um, really see how things were between them and God. That would be for their benefit and their spiritual advancement. Well, we're in chapter 21. If you open to chapter 20, you're just a chapter in, in front of it. So we're in chapter 21 tonight. And this is a description of new things that are yet to come, all things new. Of all that occupy a place in heaven, you don't see any reference whatsoever in the Bible to any of the figures of man-made religion. You don't see any reference to a pope. You don't see any reference to a Virgin Mary, to patron saints, or any of those things. That's because they're not there. And those are just symbols of man's religion, in many ways completely contrary to the God of heaven. As the outline says, that one of the greatest needs today is for faith comprehension of Bible truths. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 counsels us that we're not going to get that from the natural mind, but spiritually we can get it from the Holy Spirit as he would reveal things to us through his word. And so in childlike faith and expectation, we're to... Uh, latch on to these things. And uh, there's always a caution that, like the book of Ecclesiastes tells us, that with much study is a weariness of the flesh. So sometimes our uh, previous knowledge of the Scripture can kind of diminish our interest to where that if somebody says, well, let's turn to John 3, 16, you say, oh, I know that Scripture. You know, I memorized that. Well, uh, just to give you a little thought on that, that when our knowledge begins to erode our interest, that's when we need to really have some prayer time with God, that we don't let that happen. Because we're not perfect yet, and all the things that can wear on us will wear on us. And we have to challenge ourselves to always make sure that we don't 
began to lag behind or to let things happen. So when you think about what's ahead of us as a Christian, John chapter 14, Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. So we're not to, to look at the future with a troubled attitude, um, knowing that it's going to come to the place that are promised, that uh, the promises of God have made to us. But uh, um, not going to get too deep into John 14, but he said, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, but he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Some people have incorrectly applied that as meaning that every person that goes to heaven is going to live in a big mansion. Well, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. And when you compare that with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we can just get into heaven save so as by fire. In other words, no rewards, but we can be there. So every saved person has a place but that don't mean we have mansions. We have to, by faithfulness, earn our rewards in heaven. It's kind of like if um, a person says, well, I'm going to move to the state of Ohio. See, in my father's house are many mansions. So in the state of Ohio, there's a lot of rich farms. There's a lot of farmers that have a lot going for them. There's a lot of other things, too. But just because you're going to move to Ohio, that doesn't mean you're going to have a rich farm. And so just because there are mansions in the Father's house doesn't mean when we get to heaven, we're going to have one of them. We have to be found faithful. We have to be um, those who will earn our rewards. So I just want to pass that on because there can be that kind of dismissiveness about uh, going to heaven. Well, as long as I get there, that's all that matters because I'm going to have a mansion. And we must not have that light thought about it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it tells us that in the time of death, we are to comfort one another with the words that there's going to be the resurrection. There'll be the rapture. And the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord to meet him in the air. So we're to comfort one another with that great assurance. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And then, as you would read and study in Hebrews chapter 11, they comprehended the fact that they were just strangers and pilgrims passing through this life. And they were looking forward to the better country, to a city that was built by God. And so, um, we need to be able to look past the good in our life to see that as well as the bad in our life. Uh, sometimes we only think about heaven when we're maybe down and out, but we ought to think about it when we're on top of the mountain because it is that much greater. In the first five verses, we see that what will be has been made real to John and to us by inspiration. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, don't believe the Bible. So they say, no, that's not going to happen. They say that God's just going to sort of rejuvenate the earth, and Jehovah's Witnesses will be on it. And everybody else will be gone. But God says the old is going to pass away. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us how. It'll be by fire. It'll be consumed by fire. And what manner of people ought we be in view of the fact that everything that we know now is going to pass away. It'll be consumed. And then there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, you have those references. God will create a new heavens and a new earth. And that'll take the place of the old ones. And also in Isaiah, it tells us that the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. So all things are going to be made new. And uh, you will not remember being in Faith Baptist Church when you get to heaven or when you get to the new earth. When you get to this point that God is telling us about here, which will be on the new earth. I think we need to keep everything 
in its uh, correct time frame, that when we get to the new earth, we will not remember anything about this old world. It'll all be completely new for us. It won't even come to mind. And then um, in verse 2, this new earth is going to have a world capital to it, and that is the new Jerusalem. And he, he said, I saw it, the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this is completely fabricated and assembled in heaven and just uh, comes down as the scripture says that it will. And uh, Hebrews 11 and Hebrews chapter 12 talks about this city whose builder and maker is God. So this is a perfectly planned city. It is gorgeous, and what could we expect coming down from God out of heaven? Then he heard of new things to come. So we're now getting to the eternal daybreak, where all shadows will forever flee away. And in verse 3, we have a new habitation of God. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Dwelling with God is something unknown to us. We don't have any reference to that in our knowledge. Christ came and dwelt with man by condescending, by taking up on himself our likeness. But now we see that man goes to dwell with God because of glorification, we're made like Christ. We receive a body, a glorified body. Now, we have a couple of references back in the book of Exodus. <clears throat> and um, in the 33rd chapter, Moses, at a point in his life, had prayed that God would show him his glory because Moses um, had had some tough experiences. And so God... Um, in answer to Moses' request for God to reveal himself to Moses, he told him that he could not see his face because no man could see his face and live. But he said, I will show you my back parts. And so God did. God uh, gave Moses a glimpse of uh, him himself in passing by him. And uh, uh, in the 34th chapter, when Moses did come down off of the mount, he was not aware of it. But just seeing the glimpse of God, the back parts of God, it made his face shine. And it was so shiny that everybody was scared of him. They were afraid of him. And so he had to put a veil upon his face whenever he would be with, with the people, with anybody else, because it was so bright that it would scare him. Now, I've never seen anybody, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of makeup and stuff on, but can you imagine this? A brightness that would absolutely frighten people to see it. And so that's uh, just a little glimpse of God uh, that brought that to Moses' face. So I think if you can just kind of run the old mental wheels a little bit, can give you quite an idea that the glory of God is far beyond anything we can imagine and anything that we've ever even thought about. The glory of God is still way beyond that. So in verse four, it says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. So what a state that's going to be, to where that everything that we've ever known in the past is going to be gone. There'll be absolutely a time in which none of the things that have ever bothered us in life will ever bother us again. So again, that's hard to imagine. Uh, and... Uh, I stand here tonight. I've got pain in my foot. I've got pain in my right leg, sciatic. I'm not going to have that in heaven. So you just think about yourself and uh, all the things that you contend with 
You won't even remember ever having anything like that, a, to, a state of total perfection beyond our imagination. God will create it for us. In heaven, stop and think about it, we're going to have a righteous soul. Our soul is imputed the righteousness of Christ. It has been cleansed of all sin by redemption. And our life that we'll have in heaven will be by regeneration. The old physical life is left behind here on earth and we'll have a body by glorification. So there's not going to be any part of our natural man that's going to be there. It's all going to be the glorified. It's all going to be the redeemed. It's all going to be the made perfect. Like uh, it tells us in the book of 1 John, we don't know what we'll be like, but we know we'll be like him. And so you can just sort of uh, dwell on that a little bit. It's, it's a good thought to uh, know that everything is going to be made new about us and that this is a, a state of complete perfection. And uh, in 1 John 2.9, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 2.9, it tells us that I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for us. So uh, we don't have a mental capacity to even get into this. I mean, it's far beyond that. Uh, it's kind of like um, trying to teach a squirrel, um, you know, arithmetic. They don't have the mental capacity. So we don't have, I don't know where that came from, but anyway, we don't have the mental capacity to uh, even comprehend these things. But right for these words are true and faithful, so it's going to happen. And in God's time, it's going to happen. So we now see in verses 6 through 8, this is a part of God's eternal plan and purpose. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And uh, we know that God has always worked by plan. He's never made up things as he goes along. He knows everything before it ever happens. Uh, he knew that you would be here tonight. He knew that before you were born. Now that's again, wow, you know, that kind of blows your mind, but that just is about the uh, giving us a little idea of the omniscience of God. So um, he says, I will give unto him, after he says it is done, that means that nothing any more certain than that which God's word decrees. And of course, God is uh, the beginning and the end. And if you think about people that don't know where they came from because they believe in evolution, that's why they don't know where they're going and why they really don't have that much interest in, in salvation. God's purpose was to, and is, to give unto him that is a thirst at a fountain of the water of life freely. There's nothing any freer than salvation by grace through faith, but a person has got to want to be saved. Just like a person has got to have a thirst to drink before they drink. Uh, you don't drink water unless you have a thirst for it. Somebody can offer you some. You say, no, I'm not thirsty. People will not be saved until they want to be saved. And that's where it takes the working of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Word of God is the incorruptible seed that God uses to plant into our hearts and minds. Then the Holy Spirit is that which can give acknowledgement of the truth unto that person to where then they can make a clear choice. Uh, they can see their need of salvation, they can choose to be saved, or they can choose to reject. I think you can think about uh, Felix in the New Testament in the 24th chapter of Acts when Paul talked to him. It says he trembled and he said, go thy way for this time when I have a more convenient season. In other words, God had made it clear to him. It was there for him to accept. When he talked to King Agrippa, Agrippa said about the same thing. Almost, you persuadest me to be a Christian. So it was there, it was possible but they didn't accept it. Man has to want to accept it. And uh, <clears throat> that's why that it's not only important to have a message, but also to have a testimony that can 
uh, show other people that it certainly is worthwhile to be a Christian. And then in verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. John 5, 24 tells us that, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So that is a sure thing. Uh, we don't have that in question. Ephesians, the first chapter, tells us that we're sealed by God unto the day of redemption when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the victory through the grace of God. And in the eighth verse, the sad destiny of the unchanged, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. About all that man can, can bring forward about a, murdering, or a murderer, or someone in that category, is the weapon they used. That's about all that they can come forward with. But we see that this is all out of the heart. Christ said, all of these things do proceed because of man's sinful, spiritually dead nature. So those who do not accept the gospel, who have no interest to be saved, as the outline says, they have alienated desires and feelings. That's what's in control. Their feelings and their desires to not want to be around the things of God is real. But just as real as that is their destiny. Their destiny is just that real too. And of course, only God can make a new creature out of a sinner. And only God can give them a new destiny, which would be heaven. But a person has got to turn to God for that to happen. And you know, God's given us enough intelligence, we can reason, that that needs to be so. Uh, before I was saved, just as a nine-year-old child, I had heard many, many times, and I could quote, I could tell somebody else how to be saved, but I wasn't saved. And <clears throat> what changed my mind was, I realized one day, I don't have any hope. Because uh, I had become awake one morning in the farmhouse, and not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. And so I thought, boy, the rapture has come. I'm left behind. And I ran downstairs and found out that it hadn't come. But it changed my way of thinking. I had no hope. I had no hope. And so that caused me to take a different attitude toward hearing what God had provided for me in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's better to fight a, have to fight a fight of faith every day than it would be to have all the comforts of the world and be lost for all eternity. So there is a requirement that man must repent. God commands all men everywhere to repent. And then, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is God's rich provision for all who do. Now, Matthew chapter 19, uh, chapter 19 talks about the rich young ruler, that when he had to make a choice between his riches and just doing what the Lord told him, why, he went away sorrowful. But if you contrast that with Abraham, when God told him to offer up his only son upon an altar, well, he was obedient to it because he believed in God. If the rich young ruler would have really believed in God, he would have been willing to do that because he would have known that God is righteous and that God does not put anything upon us that's not for our best interest. So he wouldn't part with his riches, but Abraham would give up his son because of faith in God's righteousness. Now we come to the New Jerusalem. And this again goes back to the marriage that we saw in the 19th chapter of Christ and the Lamb's wife. But it says in verse 9 of, uh, of Revelation 21, 
There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now the bride of Christ is seen to be the new Jerusalem. So this is what John saw. All right, let's do some thought about this with the scripture. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about how that Christ has espoused the church to be his bride. Paul refers to that in 2 Corinthians eleven two, 2, that he has espoused the church there at Jerusalem or at uh, Corinth to be a uh, spotless bride of Christ. And of course, Christ died to redeem to himself uh, the, the church as it's expressed in Ephesians chapter five. So it's made up of those who were recognized in heaven. And I think you have to also include Revelation two and three. When God talks to the churches, the local churches that are there, and even tells them that if they don't straighten things out that needed to be straightened out, he would withdraw the candlestick. So at that point, they would no longer be recognized as a covenant New Testament church of the Lord here on earth. So why all of that if there is something not unique about the relationship of Christ and true New Testament churches? There is something unique about it. And that is that on earth, the local New Testament churches, they all are referred to as a body of Christ. In heaven, they will unite to become the bride of Christ. And you say, well, that's absurd. Well, it wasn't with Adam. You know, Adam's wife was first his body and then his bride. And so uh, the churches are first his body here on earth but they will be his bride in heaven. And this wedding had already taken place in the 19th chapter. And so now they're glorified on a new earth as a holy city. So from local assemblies on the first earth to a heavenly community on the new earth. And of course, that's why that Satan really does everything he can to uh, deny what uh, the bride of Christ is about. So when you think about the uh, millennial order, which we looked at last week in chapter 20, you have Christ the King reigning on earth with his bride uh, that he was married to in the 19th chapter of Revelation. Israel was the governing nation over all the nations of the earth. And that order appears to transfer right on to the new the new earth also. And much in keeping with what the scripture says of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Now look at verse 11 about the new Jerusalem, which is the bride of Christ, as it's made reference to here, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So every, everything about this is heavenly. You don't find anything here that uh, is uh, going to be attributed to human merits or human works. And also there's no confusion, there's clarity, there's no darkness, you have perfect light as it is mentioned here. And then in verse 12 and 13, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Now this is where a lot of people say, well, the nation of Israel is a part of the bride of Christ too. I don't think that this really um, verifies that. What it does verify is what you see on your outline. That when it comes to the New Testament and the New Testament church, it was to the Jew first. To the Jew first. 
And in uh, the days of Christ here on earth, it was a Jewish church. He established a Jewish church. And um, God called in Acts chapter 2, you will even find that before that the church went out to the Gentile nations, God called Old Testament believers into the church, Jewish people. That's recorded in Acts chapter 2. So um, you have those 12 gates unto the Jew first. And when you read and study in the book of Acts, that the church never really opened its doors to Gentile people till you get on into the book of Acts. <clears throat> but it was to the Jew first. So the gates are mentioned as having the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the foundations, this is important, in verse 14. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says that the apostles were the first set in the church. I want to read Ephesians 2, 20. This one uh, is very much clear on the subject, but Ephesians 2, 20 and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So um, you have in, in parentheses on your outline, no latter day reformers. Now there are many who claim that since the New Testament time, God has reintroduced the church. For example, Mormons. Mormons claim that the Latter-day Saints, uh, they say that Joseph Smith received some gold plaques upon a mountain somewhere, and those gold plaques were written by the finger of God, you know, copying the Moses deal where he got the tablets from God. And so the Latter-day Revelation, the Latter-day Church, no, there's only been one New Testament church that was established by God, and that was the one that was built out of the apostles first and then added to from there on. And so um, you don't find any reference here either to a Reformation area, an era in which that, you know, God started all new different uh, denominations and uh, they're all included here now. They're all written here now. You don't find any of that. You just find the church that Jesus built as being the bride of Christ. And you don't find any convention. You don't find any association. But you only find uh, the, the church that Jesus built and that being the origin of the bride of Christ. So um, have some comments on your outline. Now, Let's just say this. Can you take your Bible and separate New Testament baptism from the baptism of John? You can't. There's only one baptism given in the New Testament, as God says in Ephesians chapter 4. And the Bible tells us there was a man sent, a man sent from God whose name was John in John 1. It also tells us that John said, he that sent me to baptize. God sent New Testament baptism by John and he identified him as a Baptist. So baptism is, New Testament baptism is Baptist baptism. Now I know there's just a whole bunch of people don't want to accept that. And there are uh, churches that were once Baptists that are stepping away from the name Baptist. They don't want that because, oh, well, that's too divisive. You know, that'll run people off and this, that, and the other. But you cannot scripturally have a New Testament baptism and not have it with John's baptism because they're all the same. Now, here's the point. If man would have not invented his own churches and all churches on this earth would originate from the church Jesus built, which had only Baptist baptism, you would only have churches on this earth with Baptist baptism. 
That's all you would have. So that's all that is recognized in heaven here as being a part of the bride of Christ. I'm not saying you have to be a Baptist to go to heaven because you have to be saved before you can become a Baptist. And many people in the Old Testament were never Baptist. There are people today who are saved who are not Baptist. But when it comes to this specific honor and blessing in heaven, it all goes back to that which was built upon the foundation of the 12 apostles, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, <clears throat> like I say, man in his theology will choke on that. He will deny it and he will have all kinds of fits about it. But it's the only thing you can get when you just take the Bible. There's nothing else that you can get from it. Baptist is a biblical identity. Nobody should be ashamed of it. And I don't believe that it will run anybody off who's wanting to know the truth because it's of the Holy Spirit. God gave that identity. And guess what? The Lord Jesus Christ went to John to be baptized of him because that was heaven's New Testament baptism. Now, if it was exampled for us by Christ, why should a Baptist preacher today or any preacher today choke on that? If it was good enough for the Lord, it ought to be good enough for us today. And so I'm, I'm saying we need to get back to the Bible on these things and just go with what the Bible shows us. And you say, what are you going to do with all this out? I'm not going to do anything with it. God's going to have to deal with that, and he will. But let's just stay with what we see in the Bible. And that's what we're pointing out, that uh, what you see in the Bible, what you see in the new earth here is exactly what agrees with what you see in the beginning and all through the New Testament. And that is the church that Jesus built using the 12 disciples. Now, <clears throat> time is running out, but let's quickly go through the rest of this New Jerusalem. Pretty big. It's, uh, if you do the math, as the outline says, it's about a third the size of the United States. So you could take from the Mississippi River east and that's about how big that this new Jerusalem is. It says it's also as high as it is broad. So that's something else. And it has a wall of over 200 feet high. It's constructed of pure and precious materials. All of them are real. Um, we know we have these things on earth that we can identify with. They are real. So on earth, the New Testament church is constructed from the blood of Christ, the righteousness of God's word, and only the redeemed and justified are, are members, those who were set there by God. But in heaven, you can see now it's constructed out of these precious um, and pure materials. I want to call you to verse 21, call your attention to that. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. So you're thinking of entering the gates. They were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass. Have a comment on your outline that goes with verse 21 about the pearl. You know how a pearl is made? It's made because of an injury in an oyster. And then that injury, the oyster begins to build layers and layers and layers around it uh, because of, an, in, uh, of a, say, a grain of sand that has invaded into that oyster. So it's a result of a wound. So we enter heaven because Christ was wounded for us. He was smitten for us. So you have a likeness of a pearl in that. And then the light of the city in verses 22 and 23 it tells us that there was no temple there for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were the temple of it. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the Lamb is a light thereof. Now we've already covered um, about Moses' experience of how bright the glory of God was, but I want to add one more. Think about Saul of Tarsus. When he was on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, and a bright light 
shone around him above the brightness of the sun. And of course, it was, it was the Lord. So in heaven, there's not going to have to be a created light. God himself will be the light. And the glory of God um, will be the light that will be there. It's a resplendent glory. And then in verse 24 through 26, the new Jerusalem is the capital city of the new earth. I want you to think about what's said here. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So what does that tell you? Not everybody on the new earth is a part of the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is the capital, but there are nations there, so to speak. And there are kings there. So there's going to be a populace of people who are saved on the new earth who are not a part of the new Jerusalem, but they bring their honor and glory to it. So if every saved person was a part of the bride of Christ, then they would all be the new Jerusalem. There would be nobody else there. But this is very plain. You have the new Jerusalem, which is the bride of Christ, which comes from those who have faithfully served in local New Testament churches. And then you have all the other saved people from all of the ages past, before a church or after a church. There'll be people saved during the the millennium. There'll be people saved during the tribulation. They will be inhabitants upon this new earth, even though they don't live right in the new Jerusalem. So it just, you know, uh, the idea that everybody that's saved is a part of the bride of Christ does not fit. It does not any way at all fit. So it tells us that the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. They shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this is a place of eternal perfection. Um, This is a place where there's no night. Um, You won't have to worry about sleeping. You'll never get tired. Everything is in total harmony. There's nothing to shut out or shut in, so you don't need a gate to be shut. And um, as the outline tells us, that there will never be another fall from glory because nothing will ever enter that is going to work an abomination or make a lie. Everything that's going to be on this new earth is absolutely perfect. There'll never be a Satan that'll come around. They will deceive people. He's in, in the lake of fire. There are all lies, everything like that's gone. There's nothing but truth. There's nothing but the glory of God. So here on earth, we are counseled to strive for perfection by faith. You know, we have in our Sunday school lesson this week in Genesis 17:1. God told Abraham, be thou perfect, be thou perfect. Abraham had tried working some plans of his own with Hagar and they got an Ishmael out of it. And God says, no, you don't do that. Be thou perfect, you walk before me. That is, you follow my plan, you follow my will, you follow my word. You don't be presumptuous, you don't take uh, exceptions. You just do what I have commanded you to do. And so there's a lot of things that we can let our lives get involved with that may not be lawless. You can't really say, well, what's wrong with it? And come up with an answer. But it also (coughs) may not really be the principle of striving for what God's word teaches. And so we have to make that distinction also. So to close out, (coughs) are we glorifying God and what we're doing. And while we're here, he tells us in Ephesians 3.21, unto him be glory in the church. May we bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, we pray that you would lead and direct tonight.
in how all of these things go down in our thinking. We pray for our faith to rise to the occasion of reasoning your word about all things. To be open to it, to not be closed-minded to any of it because of something that somebody else may have said. So we <clears throat> ask now that you'll give the invitation and we pray that our thoughts would be guided by your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> for it's in Jesus' name we offer our prayer. Amen. Let's stand.